Okay, let's resume. So, we will start now by introducing Winston Hyde. Winston, please come in. He is the director of the South African National Bioinformatics Institute, SANBI, and he's also at the University of Western Cape at Belleville, South Africa. And he has worked on a number of things, but when he arrived in, in South Africa, he developed the Stack database, which is a sequence stack alignment and consensus knowledge base, using EST, aligning them, and putting all of the things together. In fact, that was, I would say, a beginning of a lot of efforts centered uh, around transcriptomics, because he has been involved a lot in transcriptomics. He's responsible for the EVOC ontologies, which are also a, a way to classify tissue and libraries for transcriptomics also studies. And he worked also as director of genomics at MassPAR, I think that's when we first met, and founded Electric Genetics with, uh, in South Africa. And of course, he's the founder and director of uh, Sanbi. Now, as links, geographical links up at Cardiff, Philadelphia, where then you went, Houston, Washington DC and Smithsonian. I didn't know that you went to Smithsonian at one point. Sunnyvale, where MassPAR was, and now Belleville in uh, South Africa. And like Michael Ashbrunner, I would say that you have to add since the rest of the world because you always meet uh, Winston in different meetings. So I think you travel probably a lot and lots. So let's put that you also are everywhere else. As Bowlings, I put Tanya Hyde in between uh, parentheses Broviac because that's the name I knew her when she was, uh, I mean, project manager at Intel Genetics. Oliver Hoffman, who is working on the ontology. And I put Mina, she's part of the group. And so it was the only reason I selected her as part of the Sanbi group is that a lot of you from the Swiss Prod groups at EBI and Geneva know her because she was the Swiss Prod annotator at EBI. Now, it's probably, and I hope for all of us, that he's the only one among us to have experienced a very bad zen-like experiment. Imagine you go to bed in a house which is full of, I mean, a normal house with your wife and your dog, and you wake up and everything is gone. And that's what happened to him, I mean, a few years ago, where basically some burglars, I mean, uh, I mean, put some gas, soporific gas into his house and completely emptied the house with a moving van. So I think that's a bad experiment and you're probably the only one in the world to have experienced, I mean, in here, not in the world, in this world here to have experienced that. So, I mean, I, I could go on with a lot of anecdotes with Winston because what I wanted to say by this anecdote is every time you meet him, extraordinary things happens to him. He comes to Geneva, he goes without a visa, to France, then get arrested at the border, gets passed anywhere, and then, I mean, you know, basically, every time you meet him, you're sure there's going to be something which is going to happen. So I don't know what's going to happen during the talk, <laughs> but Winston, welcome. Thank you so much, Amos. Thank you so much. Amos, I need to thank you personally for uh, a great deal that you have done. But in actual fact, there are a number of people in the room here today that know who you are, each of whom I regard as friends, and each of whom have helped me establish bioinformatics in South Africa and on into Africa. And for that, our country and uh, our continent need to thank you, and the depth of that appreciation runs through everything we do every day, and you know who you are. Uh, I would also like to mention just two individuals who uh, are here who are my South African colleagues, Nicola Mulder and Thuri Yaber, who have also uh, helped me and others establish this system that we run in South Africa. And it's no, through no small effort on their part uh, that we are uh, 
on, onwards going, and we're, we're part of the consortium that is part here today. Okay, so um, today I want to start with an anecdote because it seems that that's what you have to do, and that is an anecdote to do with Amos. Uh, my wife, Tanya, was working at Electric Genetics. I was working at Maspar, a hardware company. She was software, I was hardware, and uh, prior to that uh, meeting um, where the operating system was running with uh, Amos, he actually was visiting uh, Tanya, who was the product manager for uh, PC Gene, and uh, he was working with some of the systems engineers there, on, uh, and the platform they were working with was Solaris. And um, he was in a room uh, chatting, and uh, suddenly one of the engineers ran in and said, the sun is on fire. Oh, no, the sun is on fire. And Amos, instead of looking at the machine that was smoking, went to the window, looked up and said, you're right. You have to respect people who have a sense of humor. So today I'd like to discuss divining the organizing principle, and this is just because you have to find a pompous name to give to a talk when you don't really have very much to say. I promise to make a relatively content-free presentation with spattered with some data. Um, <clears throat> and what I'd like to talk about actually is this word divine. And you know, divine is an adjective, and it's a wonderful adjective. It's almighty, it's powerful, it's beautific. And it's also a verb, and in that verb, there's a wonderful set of words. You can anticipate, you can fulfill, you can have foreknowledge, you can foretell. But when trying to determine the organizing principle for biology, there's only one real way to do that, and that is to make a beautiful guess. And this work we're doing is really entertaining and beautiful, but at the same time, we're really in a field where guesswork is what we do a little well. If you take a look at the organization of the cell, and this is an image rendered by a colleague of mine, Brad Marsh, from the University of Queensland, the complexity is awe-inspiring. And you can stare for a long time at this uh, rendition and try and determine the various cellular structures. But if you are in the domain where you have tried to organize information and you are willing to ask a query where you, where you wish to render and provide information on the endoplasmic reticulum, and the associated ribosomes, you need to ask the query in such a way that the system will provide you with insight. And if you're lucky, you can see clearly in the context of the cell exactly what's going on. So in a sense, that's where we're trying to head with the kind of work that we do at SAMBI in terms of divining the information. And we do that by data integration. And we call it that uh, because simply that's the best word we can use for it. And what I'd like to tell you about today is how we integrate expression source information, splicing events in the isoforms of genes, and the transcription regulatory apparatus that is involved with that. We haven't brought them together yet in a way where we can do too much, but we're starting on a, on a journey that I think is going to be quite fruitful. I warn you that my talk is to keep you awake, so there will be some interjections and photographs that I've been taking this week will be coming through. So one of the first things that we did a while back was to work on algorithms which organize messy, dirty information. In South Africa, you can't be too choosy about where you get your information because you have to work with the waste products of the developed world. ESTs represent that very nicely, and as you know, ESTs are very similar to going out on a date, on your first date. Um, there's a lot of promise, but you're not quite sure what you're going to get. So in terms of working with these raw ESTs, we've, we worked with them for a great deal, and by looking at the source of the information from which they have come, we've been able to put together some kind of rendition or a virtual transcript, and that process has given us insight into the origin of the libraries from which they arrived. I just want to update you with where we've been working in this field to, to, to note a couple of things. One, the system we use, Stack and Stack Pack, actually now incorporates modernized algorithms, and I'm very proud to announce that at the end of next week, we are putting this into the public domain and making it open source. And as part of that effort, I'd like to point out that the system uses uh, tools which loosely cluster information and is very, very sensitive for capturing alternate splicing information. We've also been taking a look at metagenomic data with the system, and I'm pleased to say that it's, it's very, uh, it appears to be quite effective in terms of uh, use as compared to single genome assemblers in terms of coverage and capture of single genome information in metagenomic studies. <clears throat> and finally, I'd like to point out that with this looser pipeline approach that we use, 
is very good at capturing alternative explanation, uh, expression. I'm not going to uh, show you data, as I mentioned, but I just want to show you we have done some work, and there is a publication we're working on. One of the people we work with is quite adept at picking pertinent information, and this is the individual at a bar in, Barcelona, in uh, Madrid. That was a more sober moment, and uh, <clears throat> I was discussing with him, actually, the concepts of formalizing biological information when we were doing that. But formalizing biological description is uh, what we're up to. And we, we've seen a beautiful um, uh, rendition of how far Go has taken us uh, previous to me. But I wanted to point out that in terms of that uh, ontology, I really believe that ontologies are really where uh, integration is, is at. And uh, uh, the ontological process where we decide, describe what kinds of things exist and then we describe the relationships between them, and this slide is provided to me by Chris Mungel, is the basis upon which we do our gene expression integration. So let's take a look at the expression stores uh, studies that we've been doing, and point out that we capture information from many technologies, where we're technology blind, and what we do is we look at any type of technology where there is an expression library, where we're capturing the source of the information. Classic example is a unigene cluster, and in that cluster we can find many, many different terms, all higgledy-piggledy in free text. What we've wanted to do with that kind of information is ask queries like this, and in 2001 we set ourselves a challenge, give me all transcription factors expressed in heart from 0 to 20 years in human, and show those that are in pathological states. I'm very happy to say that we're able to answer those queries with the data that we have today. The domains of the Evoke system include an anatomical cell type, developmental, and pathology. And as you heard earlier, the cell type is uh, in great integrating in various ways with the cell ontology now. And the key aspect of Evoke, if there's nothing else you take home today uh, that I'd like to stress with you, is simply that the information is hierarchically organized in discrete on ontologies. So this orthogonal hierarchical relationship is very simple. Biologists like that because it's easy to visualize, it's easy to see, you can follow it with your finger. And that's very important for most scientists who are not adept at understanding the concept of a DAG. There are several implementations of Evoke in various proprietary and non-proprietary systems, and the ones obviously we're very proud of talking about today is, is the implementation that will be coming, will be published soon with uh, one of the Uniprot releases. And we've been working with Sarah Nella and Amos on that, and Oliver's worked very hard, together with Mina, to deliver that. Deliver that, And we're actually up to date on that, I believe. The conceptual basis, then, is to have terms which relate to libraries, some kind of source, and then relate to some kind of gene information. And that really is just the simplistic way we do this work. In a slightly more uh, educated way, or a slightly more detailed way of describing that, if we go from a gene, we can go via, uh, in this simple graph, we can go via one or two of the annotation systems of that gene through ESTs, through Unigene, through GenBank cDNA libraries, through to an evoked term. And this is a very simple relationship, as you can see. We have a number of mat mappings which are in the SwissProt system. <coughs> and access to the system is via download and via mailing lists. And this is the evocontology.org site where up-to-date information is provided. The back, the back end of this is quite sophisticated and growing. Um, I'm not going to go into too many details today. There's a nice graphic that was provided to me by uh, Oliver Hoffman that demonstrates the relationships between various of the ontologies. And the clarity that I'm trying to seek here is to demonstrate to you actually that there are discrete ontologies which link um, in a very hierarchical manner through to high-level terms. So we use simple terms and not many of them. And because it's very broad, it's actually possible to bin information in a consistent manner. Querying the system allows us to be able to ask queries like, give me uh, libraries which contain genes which are expressed in the liver and in neoplasia. And in actual fact, that simple query is not a very easy one to ask, given the bio diaspora systems out there. And by the fact that each of the entries we hand uh, curate, and there are over uh, seven or 8,000 DST libraries alone in this system, has meant that we've carefully checked the relationships and that is the positive aspect, the Swiss protein likeness of Evoke, in that we've gone through manual curation. And a final example of that is here in a kidney adenocarcinoma, which is just a term. And what we do in the system is we split it into anatomical and uh, pathological uh, 
ontologies, and we can see that we give assigned terms and definitions and do the usual ontology thing. Once again, it's time to consider our scientific background. This one is in Bangkok. <clears throat> Julio's really funny when he gets drunk, isn't he? I, mean, <laughs> I, love, I, love, I enjoy working with him. I want to say that, um, I wish I was, um, we've used this system, and what I want to stress here is that really you can't do a good job of developing any kind of standard or ontology unless it's in your hands and you're applying it. And one of the key aspects of it is that the selection pressure on the ontology is what gives it its value. It's completely useless to put it out there and leave it dead. It must be part of the community. And it, be working from South Africa, that is a challenge, but we work as hard as we can to keep those community links alive. In this example, um, we were looking at uh, this, is an actual, this is when we just had a structured vocabulary as opposed to an ontology. We were just looking at gene expression events that were in retina with respect to retinitis pigmentosa, which was a gene we were helping to locate on chromosome 8. And we did find it because the only gene that was expressed in the group that we looked at entirely in the retina was one that was labeled as such in our system, and it turned out to be RP1. So that's a very simple example of how it can be applied. Integrating your own data with lab data is one of the key aspects of this ontological system. <clears throat> and I'd like to express now a, a little story about a, a set of genes known as the can cancer testis genes, which are fascinating. And they're fascinating because they're expressed in cancers and they're expressed in testis, but they're not usually expressed in any other... They, they're expressed in, in that restricted form. They tend to be biased in their expression to those two particular states. So they're fascinating to look at from an, Im an immunological perspective as well as a scientific perspective, uh, sorry, a, um, a health perspective. If we classify sets of these genes, which are of interest to us, into their distribution profile, such that those are only expressed in testis or expressed in one or more gametogenetic tissues, and go through to four categories of expression. So we simplify, once again, into broad bins, the information. We have the arrogance just to be very loose in our organization. And we compare uh, our RT-PCR profile done on tissues in very high resolution with a database profile. And in the red is the RT-PCR, and in blue is the evoke representation. We get quite a lot of consistency, as long as our bins are loose. And that is an experiment. These are the names of the genes below and uh, the expression uh, category on the left. But that is an experiment that um, really struck home to me when, we, when I did this work with my uh, student, Samir, um, just how uh, useful it is, or perhaps arrogant it is, to organize information loosely and to look for trends which are at very high level. There's another one of these high level events. So if you look at transcript complexity, uh, you really are then starting to look at a challenge because, as we know, our understandings of the paradigms of transcriptomics are constantly being changed almost by the day as we discover new kinds of phenomena within the RNA world. And just uh, the latest set is at the bottom. Um, but, but, but by working with the Phantom Consortium, um, it has been clear that there is a great deal of uncharted territory out there. And working with this consortium has given us wonderful access to information that is very high resolution in terms of the capture of the transcription initiation event. And I'm referring specifically to CAGE technology, or capped analysis of gene expression, where you have a capped, uh, uh, initiation, a capped initiation event, cDNA. What I'm showing here is a slide that demonstrates the distribution of expression libraries across the transcription initiation events for a single transcriptional unit or gene. They're not the same thing, but I'm just uh, using the inter terms interchangeably right now. <clears throat> if you look at the top left, you can see the representation within a liver, so then going through adipose representation, then down to other swarms of liver libraries on the right. And what's important for, to see is that the first exon actually, uh, first, or oh, sorry, that it's important to see is on the right-hand side, there's a, lot, there's a great more representation in the, uh, a great deal more cage tags basically are, are initiating at one particular place, and then there's a distribution of initiation events. So the promoter or promoters for this particular transcriptional unit set is, are diverse. And there's a modal set of promoters, and then there are some more discrete promoters which represent specific initiation events from specific forms of libraries. 
to uh, peel that particular system apart actually has taken a great deal of work because what we've had to do is look at the system from the perspective of both mouse and human and to try and fill the matrix in areas where we don't have information by looking at developmental stages in human, developmental and human anatomical stages, and mouse developmental and human, uh, mouse, hu mouse and human anatomical stages. And if you look at the top, we've taken existing ontologies and we've rested them into the evoke system, so we've detangled them and placed them in a hierarchical structure, gone through development and annotation, and then mappings, and other, may, some of you may not be able to see the bottom of the slide, we can go all the way down to the transcriptional unit and the clone ID and the Ricken Lick Library ID and go through and query the system based upon that particular structure. Not to mention, uh, not to forget that we can also incorporate now uh, the cell ontology into that kind of system. By doing that kind of work, what we've been able to do is, and this is a heat map, it's not a classic array, um, but effectively we've been able to look at homologs in terms of mouse and human in the cancer testis genes in this particular example, <clears throat> so human evoke and MGI, and then to query those homologs based upon the expression profile such that, and you can't see the terms, but we can, we can see that expression is common between human and mouse in fetus or in adult. And talking of adults, here's another one that I've been playing with. And what I'd like to do with respect to these CT genes is discuss a specific data integration project. So taking a look now at how we combine not only the expression source, uh, and I'll come up with the splicing event shortly, but the transcription regulation, how do we take that information we've learning, been learning about in terms of the transcription initiation event and combine it? Here's a topological description of the distribution of expression for one of the CT genes. And you can see on the very far left-hand side, there's an empty-looking bar that actually represents the developing testers. And there's a modal transcription start site, and then there are other transcription events and libraries associated. But what's intriguing is that there are a number of different libraries from the developing testers all initiating at the same site, and it's a discrete site. If we take a look at one of these horrible graphs, but basically if we take a look just to show you the, the start of the process at all the possible promoter elements that are associated with all of those events in all of the cancer testers genes that we've examined, and then we start to break it down to a mini network, and the names of some of these genes are in blue here, together with promoter elements associated, and then we look at other uh, overrepresented sets what we can see is that there appear to be sets of regulatory elements that are common to the entire group. And that's very interesting because we're trying to find ways to unify the understanding of these particular genes. And then look at the associated transcription factors. And the, with the aim of being able to understand the regulatory modules that are being in, initiated for this particular system. So here are some common regulatory modules. And you'll take a look. You'll see bands of gene names uh, gene initiation events, but I'll go to one more slide. And uh, you see here now uh, there is a set of, um, uh, on the far left-hand side, there's a, on the vertical column, that represents tra discrete transcription initiation events for one of these particular cancer test genes. And then along the bottom, uh, le running left to right, you see the module represented. And you can see, now look carefully, as we move the bar down, a different set of modules being involved in the same gene initiation. If we look at that from a developmental perspective, look at those same genes, we can see some developmental regulatory modules which differ uh, in, in, two, in two, two events. We see a discrete set on the far left-hand side in, in the green and red where we have a developmental set of transcription initiation events. And here's another thinking moment with respect to that transcription initiation. So how do we combine that with the splicing events? This is a very deep challenge, and it's one that we're, I must admit, uh, we've only started on this particular journey. But we are working at bringing together the information in such a way that we can consistently apply it to both splicing, transcription regulation, and expression source. And this has been driven by our project uh, with respect to old splice DB, and you've heard a little bit about that. <clears throat> and within that community of alternative splicing, there are many different groups which represent and describe alternate splicing. And one of the efforts which Oliver Hoffman is driving uh, this afternoon at the uh, Alt Splicing SIG is the community discussion of uh, alternative splicing standards. And actually we've had one uh, brief discussion about that as well at this meeting. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity to put out a document 
that um, together with our colleagues here that uh, allows us to begin a community discussion of the development of standards in alternative splicing. What we're particularly interested in is cancer-related isoforms, and we've been working on a project with the HED consortium to un analyze and understand that better with the benefit of being able to test what we find in the laboratory. So by manually choosing these items from the HED, organizing them in a heat map, finding particular exons that are of interest to us that appear to have a representation that's unique to cancer, and then positively testing those exons, we hope to be able to, to make biomarker-related discovery. <clears throat> the problem is describing the exon intron structure. And this is uh, some work uh, that Oliver's representing here, and I'd like to particularly thank uh, Victor Yonganil and Christian Isley for the work that they've done to make, us, make a tremor available to us, which is a tool which uh, analyzes the output from SIM4 that's allowed us to represent uh, these items as a graph, but basically what you're trying to see here is that by bringing together the expression source as well as the graph structure of the isoform, we're able to begin to think about how to query this kind of information and how to make consistent pattern detection. The aim, of course, is to provide us with an expression that allows us to describe the evoke term, the spacing, directionality, and composition of the promoter elements, and the associated sequence ontology-driven splice graph and putting that together in a static form, analyzing that, making some empirical observations, and then starting to think about how to make a dynamic representation of the process. That's where we're going, and we're looking for help. So if anybody has anything to support us with there, we'd appreciate it. So that's my idea of uh, data representation, where we're looking at expression source, splicing event, and transcription regulation. We have a long way to go, and we understand that, but why I feel quite strongly that by bringing in and working tightly with a community and working tightly with uh, established colleagues who are generating good quality data and contributing back into that community, you can gently and firmly drive forward research of your own. And the only way to make that successful is to work closely with the standards which are in development. <clears throat> so now I'm going to digress a little bit to other work we're doing in South Africa and talk a little about a disease, and this is not Drosophila, this is Setsi, this is Equocyna morsitans, that afflicts about 500,000 people a year and kills a large number of those people in Africa. And we're working to, with the, together with the International Equocyna Genomics Initiative to, in, to begin an African-led or African-driven understanding of the Setsi fly genome. And in order to do that, what we're trying to do is work very closely once again with the Western community, which is providing the resources, the, 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 the capacity, the experience. But what we're doing that's unique is that we're attempting to discover the distribution and population genetics of this fly, not only at a, a, a microsat le level, but also at a genomic level throughout Africa. And we, what we've done recently is bring together individuals from around Africa, sponsored by the World Health Organization, to try and develop an understanding of the biology of the fly from a genomic perspective in Africa with scientists who are learning genomics on the fly, if you don't mind the pun, in order that when we do attempt to publish this information, when the whole genome is annotated, we have a very strong biological story to tell that's embedded in the disease in Africa. And the disease I'm referring to, of course, is sleeping sickness. To that end, what we're attempting to do is establish a, 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 one of the aspects of that that we're very interested in is to establish an annotation jamboree. And you will be hearing from me more about that as we attempt to work in that particular domain. And in, and in December of this year, we'll be discussing the first steps of how to get there. One of the ways to get there is to team once again with our colleagues in the developed world. And this particular uh, team I'd like to describe is with Ross Altman's group at Stanford. And where we've, we've gone to get, we've, we've approached Fogarty and said, please give us money to help establish biomedical leadership in Africa as opposed to relying on our colleagues in the West. And to that end, we've had a, a quite a successful program to date where we're training PhD students and postdocs and junior faculty to learn the principles of um, something to learn the principles of uh, biomedical informatics, not only in South Africa, but by traveling to Stanford and working together with the, the groups such as the Biomedical Cons uh, Ontologies Consortium in order to establish knowledge of what it's like to be an international graduate student, to, 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 to get an idea of what it is to deliver in an international context. And that is the challenge that we really face in Africa, in that we're very, very strong on intellect but we're very, very weak on understanding of the global context of the work that we do. 
And I really do wish to stress just how much we rely upon yourselves and the, the goodwill that, or, or that has been extended from all of you to help us establish and develop that particular aim to its full uh, end. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to some of the groups which have helped us, uh, which include, of course, uh, uh, Sarah Nella and Amos in particular. I'd like to thank uh, for allowing us the opportunity to deliver. And the, there's a number of groups here that you can see that we're involved with, and I really do want you to know that we appreciate every single thing that has been done for us. And talking of which, here's my final uh, interpretation. I thought he's rather cute in that little hat. And I'd like to point out that if you are uh, going to visit uh, Cape Town, it really does look like this. And we, work, we live and work in this environment, and it's one of the reasons that we enjoy our work so much every day. Um, and uh, actually, Sambi's just off the slide on the left. I'd like to thank you all very much for your time. Let's thank Wynn Hyde again.